I want to have you turn to one verse as we address this man, Roger Williams. We find that the providence of God was greatly involved in his life, so much so that we will make mention of it to some degree as we go through his life story. We look to Proverbs chapter 20, uh, chapter 20, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 24. Proverbs 20, verse 24, man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? In our country, we have enjoyed freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, as it's sometimes said. There has not been a land that we have freedom such as we have in all of human history. The length of time, to what extent we have it. We rejoice in that, and yet there's another side that we say, how sad that so many go on without a care of the things of God. It's really pretty sad. Because there's lands that they struggle to try and meet together. They couldn't meet like we are today. But some of them are more serious than any in our country, or most in our country, I should probably say. So, uh, we don't give this to take away from what the Lord has done for us in our land. We certainly recognize what He has done. But yet, there is some thought in that way. Now, in this title that is given, Roger Williams, An Enigma in Baptist History, I thought I'd better define enigma. I'm afraid some of us wouldn't know what it meant. Brother Blevins helped me out last night. The enigma machine was that device made by the Germans, used by the British, to break the code. That's not so far off, after all. Because... An enigma is a person or thing that is mysterious, puzzling, or difficult to understand. Not a bad description for the life of this man. I'm going to start with his early life and just work right on through. In some ways, you might wonder why he spends so much time upon certain details of his life. But if you don't know the whole of the story as best as we can condense it, you won't appreciate what we have as much. And so let me begin in his early days. He was born in London, probably about 1603. His father was a tailor. His mother came from the family of one of the gentry, one of the nobility in St. Albans. Little is known of Roger Williams' childhood. In his surviving writings and letters, He mentions his upbringing or his father only once. As he approached his 30th year, when he recalled being, quote, persecuted in and out of my father's house these 20 years, a reference to life at home and after leaving home. At an early age, he was converted. His father did not approve of this. Roger Williams is best remembered as a staunch advocate for religious liberty, separation of church and state, for his fair dealings with the Indians, the American Indians, as founder of Rhode Island Colony, and as founder of the earliest Baptist church in America at Providence, Rhode Island. Although, this is what you'll find said about him so often, it's repeated time and again, that he was the founder of the first Baptist church in America. That's not true as far as I could find. That's inaccurate. There was a church, at least one, perhaps two, that was begun about a year before his. It's one of those things where something is said and others just keep repeating and repeating and repeating it. That is not actually the point that I'm going to uh, make too much of a deal of here in this message. But I just lay that out. I'll say a little more later. When Williams was a teenager, 13 or 14 years old, he was noticed by Sir Edward Coke, spelled C-O-K-E, taking notes of a sermon in shorthand. This was very unusual in that day to take shorthand. 
Coke saw in the boy exceptional potential, and the lawyer came to take a deep interest in the future of the teenager. According to David Benedict in his General History of the Baptist, he writes, Coke asked father, uh, William's father to, quote, let him have the care of Roger, and the request was readily granted. It was then standard for most servants and nearly all children in such positions to lodge with their employer, who re- routinely supplied meat, drink, and apparel and lodging. Who is this Sir Edward Coke we're speaking of? If you look in the encyclopedia, you're going to read something on this order. And different encyclopedias will say it's similar, maybe a few different words, but this is basically what it's going to say. Sir Edward Coke, 1552-1634, was an English barrister, judge, and politician who is considered to be the greatest jurist in the Elizabethan and Jacobean eras. Coke is best known in modern times for his institutes, described by John Rutledge as almost the foundation of our law. And his reports have been called perhaps the single most influential series of named reports. Historically, he was a highly influential judge within England and Wales. His statements and works were used to justify the right to silence, which we still have in our land. While the statute of monopolies is considered to be one of the first actions in the conflict between Parliament and monarch that led to the English Civil War. In America, Koch's decision in Dr. Bonham's case was used to justify the voiding of both the Stamp Act, 1765, and writs of assistance, which led to the American War of Independence. After the establishment of the United States, his decisions and writings profoundly influenced the Third and Fourth Amendments to the United States Constitution while necessitating the Sixteenth Amendment. Our founding fathers quoted Coke when giving reason for separation from British rule. There can be no question that it was the providence of God that this is the man that took Roger Williams under his wing. As a judge, Coke defended the common law as interpreted by Parliament, and he viewed common law as superior to any law laid laid down by ecclesiastical or prerogative courts, such as the High Commission and the Council of the North. And what this is saying is the king is not superior to law. That's what it's saying. That's what it's getting across. King James was greatly angered that a senior lawman would believe that common law was superior to the king. The king sent out a warning to Coke to, quote, toll the party line or suffer the consequences. Coke refused to do so. He continued to speak out that common law was superior to the king's prerogative. This is how Coke spent much of his time in his career, fighting against the tyranny of the king. John Barry, in his book Roger Williams and the Creation of the American Soul, wrote, Williams would have accompanied him to court, meaning Mr. Coke, Sir Edward Coke, to the Star Chamber, to the Privy Council, Unnoticed in the background, he nonetheless saw what Coke saw, listened as Coke listened. He did not simply read Coke's word. He heard Coke speak the words. He wrote down the words. He then translated the words from shorthand into a text Coke read and revised. William Bra- uh, Williams breathed Coke and lived Coke. His lessons were not something studied, they were lived. Williams was in the king's presence and also present on occasion when the king's son, who became King Charles, often enough to refer to it in a routine way. To be in the presence of the king came to a point it didn't impress him so much. It didn't overwhelm him. At least once he saw James receive a message from Coke, quote, sore against his will, end quote. Royalty did not impress him. He considered James vicious, a swearer from his youth, and an oppressor and a persecutor of good men. The words of 
Williams himself. This man, Coke, by the account of his own daughter, she said he took such a liking to Williams and considered him so hopeful a youth. And that daughter didn't like Williams. She called for the hanging of Williams. She didn't agree with her father's assessment. That was later in life a little bit, but still, she didn't like him. But that's what she said about her own father and his care for Coke or Williams. Coke paid for Williams to be educated at Charterhouse School and also at Pembroke College, Cambridge. Originally ordained as an Anglican minister at Cambridge, he came to understand salvation by grace, becoming a Puritan. And I might interject here that many Baptists claim him as Baptist, but that's probably a better description of a Puritan. He was officially a Baptist for about four months. So uh, it'd be more accurate to say he was a Puritan. He was a good man, but to most accurately describe him, he was Puritan. He had a gift for learning languages, became familiar with Latin, Hebrew, Greek, Dutch, and French. Then we come a little later in his life, a time of persecution and a time when he had to flee from England. Roger Williams became a Puritan at Cambridge somewhere around 1627 to 1628. In this, uh, rather in 1627 or 28, he became a, a chaplain to a wealthy family, Sir William Mesham. This was one of the ways the Puritans could avoid scrutiny by the Church of England and Charles I. At this time, there was much persecution from Charles I and Bishop Laud, who would become Archbishop Laud, who would not tolerate the Puritans in the Church of England. And finally, Laud would not tolerate them in England. Now, the Puritans tried to stay in the Church of England and purify it. They didn't try and come out of it, at least of many of them that we are speaking of in this way. So this was about 1627, 1628, that he was this chaplain for a wealthy family. I want to mention a few dates to you, just so you have them in your mind a little bit. 1620 is when the Puritans came to America. They were separatists, or much more of separatists, than the Puritans that we have mentioned thus far. And they had withdrawn from the Church of England and from Anglicanism. Their leaders, of course, fled first to Holland and then later came to our shores. 1620 for the Puritans. 1628, a group of Puritans fled England to avoid the persecution of Charles I and Bishop Laud. And they came to Salem, which is part of Massachusetts. They were on the verge of separation from the Church of England when they left. When they reached this land, they took up more with the position of their brethren at Plymouth. Then two years later, approximately 1630, others came to settle at Boston. These were of the Puritan party within the Church of England, not separating, not seeking to separate. Upon arrival here, these are the very words they spoke, if you doubt this. Quote, we leave it the Church of England, we leave it, therefore, not therefore as loathing that milk wherewith we were nourished there, but blessing God for the parentage and education as members of the same body shall always rejoice in her good, end quote. That lets you know they still were in that group or that fellowship. These Puritans were largely Cambridge graduates they had become Calvinistic in their theology. They did not want to leave the established church, but rather to reform it. Now, they did preach the Word of God. That is something that we can say for them. And there's many of those writers we would enjoy reading. But they thoroughly believed in the union of church and state. There's a whole study here that you could do on this. That's rather interesting. In England, the union of church and state went from king through church. Here it went the other direction, but it was still tyranny. The tyranny was still there. You cannot have the union of church and state, well, until Christ returns. Then it will work perfect. can't have it before then. 
So they believed in the union of church and state, whose authority in the realm of religion was absolute and would therefore permit no area of dissent. When these Puritans came to Boston, which was called the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they came with a determination to create a theocratic state. They spoke of it as God's kingdom on earth and a city set on a hill, the words they'd use, similar in pattern to Old Testament Israel. It was to be a state in which the church was supreme in the realm of religion and would tell the state what to do in civil matters. That's the direction the authority would go in, religious to civil. And the civil was to carry out what the religious side told them. These Puritans fled the tyranny of England, where the government was supreme over the realm of religion, only to set up their form of tyranny church and state union. Well, coming back to the story of Roger Williams then. He married his wife, Mary Bernard, in December 1629. About a year later, 1630, December of, of that year, they would set sail for America to get away from the persecution of Laud. He had been summoned to appear before Laud. Anyone summoned to appear before Laud Unless they recanted, they're headed for the Tower of London. They're to suffer until they would die, and sometimes very miserably to suffer. Sometimes to live many years, sometimes not so long, but torture and a miserable death. Williams wrote of this time, Truly it was as bitter as death to me when Bishop Laud pursued me out of this land and my conscience was persuaded against the national church, ceremonies, and bishops, I say it was bitter as death to me when I rode Windsor way to take ship at Bristol. Many years later he wrote, God knows what gains and preferments I have refused in universities, city, country, and court, in old England, and something in New England to keep my soul undefiled in this point, and not to act with a doubting conscience." Williams and his wife sailed on the ship Lyon, spelled L-Y-O-N, from Bristol, December 1st, 1630. After 66 days' journey on rough seas, they arrived off Nantasket, February 5th, 1631. Judge Durfee writes of Williams' flight, He was obliged to fly or dissemble his convictions, meaning cover them up, hide them. He was obliged to fly or dissemble his convictions, and for him, as for all noblest natures, a life of transparent truthfulness was alone an instinct and a necessity. This absolute sincerity is the key to his character, as it was always the mainspring of his conduct. It was this which led him to reject indignantly the compromises with his conscience from time to time which were proposed to him, it was this which impelled him, when he discovered the truth, to proclaim it. When he detected an error, to expose it. When he saw an evil, to try and remedy it. When he could do good, even to his enemies, to do it. And so he arrives in America. Norman Cox writes, 30 months before Puritan pastor John Cotton reached Boston, Roger Williams arrived. He had come with a high dream of a community and government, where one would be free to develop his own faith from the Word of God without molestation from church or state. That's the end of the quote from Norman Cox. When Roger Williams arrived in America, he thought he would find a congenial atmosphere for which he longed. But he found himself most disappointed and unhappy. He found that at Boston they had not understood these matters of the union of church and state and the corruption that will come in with this union. They had not renounced the errors of the Church of England. They had formed separate churches, but they had not separated far enough. He wanted them to make a public de uh, declaration of their repentance for having communion with the Church of England while they live there. Williams thought that the magistrate had no right to punish for the first table of the law. The second table deals with man against man or 
man's relationship with man. First table, God with man. Upon arrival in America, he was first welcomed to Massachusetts and invited to become a teacher for the Boston church. He declined that invitation because they were unseparated from the established Church of England. The Boston people who believed their church to be, quote, the most glorious on earth, were astonished at his refusal. But Williams had seen the oppression from this union of church and state in England. One incident from many will show the brutality of the Church of England towards those who became Puritan and a separatist from their own ranks. Neal, in his History of the Puritans, tells of Dr. Lytton's persecution in England following his arrest and sentence by Archbishop Laud. The sentence went in this way, quote, that he be committed to the prison of the fleet for life and pay a fine of 10,000 pounds that the high commission to, uh, should degrade him from his ministry and that he should be brought to the pillory. That's that wood device that they would lock the head and the wrists in. And then they would begin to uh, whip the person or punish the person, torture them. So he'd be brought to the pillory at Westminster while the court was sitting and be publicly whipped. After whipping, be set upon the pillory a convenient time and have one of his ears cut off and the side of his nose split and be branded in the face with the double SS for a sower of sedition. That then he be carried back to prison and after a few days be pilloried a second time in Cheapside and have the other side of his nose split and his other ear cut off. And then be shut up, closed in prison for the rest of his life. That's the way they treated those that were dissenters. Roger Williams lived in this district where this cruel sentence was carried out, witnessing this before his flight from England. Can you blame him for standing against this union of church and state? All those cruelties. So Williams said this of the Boston church when he got here. Being unanimously, unanimously chosen as teacher at Boston... I conscientiously refused because I durst not officiate an unseparated people. They had moved across the ocean to establish a church and government that would not tolerate dissent, and he wanted nothing of it. He declared that civil government had no authority to enforce religious beliefs, and his criticism quickly earned their hostility. After refusing the Boston church, Roger Williams was invited by the Salem Church to be assistant to Mr. Skelton, their aging pastor. He accepted the invitation in April 1631. The general court in Boston was not happy with the Salem Church, and the persecution from this church no doubt led to his retirement from Salem at the close of this same summer. He left the Massachusetts Bay Colony and became assistant to Ralph Smith, pastor at Plymouth. The Plymouth people were better suited to Williams being separatists. They had withdrawn from the established church order to form a church more after the pattern of the primitive order. Williams remained in Plymouth for about two years. Governor Bradford praised Williams' qualities as a minister, but did not agree with his position on separation of church and state, considering it what he called questionable judgment. But he later wrote of William's teaching, saying, His teaching, well approved, for ye benefit whereof I still bless God, and am thankful to Him, even for His sharpest admonitions and reproofs, as far as they agree with truth. Well, that's what William Bradford wrote of Roger Williams. At Plymouth, Roger Williams came in contact with the Indians who would visit Plymouth from time to time. He gained the confidence of the Indian, uh, Indians through his dealings with them. He studied their language, evangelized them, developed friendships with them. He wrote in one of his letters, My soul's desire was to do the natives good, and to that end to have their language, which I afterwards printed. Near the close of his life, he referred to these earlier experiences 
God was pleased to give me a painful, patient spirit to lodge with them in their filthy smoke to gain their tongue. The confidence Roger Williams built with the Indians was surely the providence of God preparing the way for the founding of a new colony made possible through these very Indians. Later, Williams wrote a book titled A Key into the Language of America or An Help to the Language of the Natives in that part of America called New England. This book was a bestseller and was the first in America on the American Indian language. It introduced and popularized numerous words into our language, including moccasin, moose, papoose, squash, squaw, many others. We still use from time to time in our day. Williams returned a second time to Salem as the assistant to Mr. Skelton. He was a self-supporting minister. He did not receive support from the tax revenues as the Puritan pastors received. He wrote, At Plymouth I spake on the Lord's Day and on weekdays and worked hard at my hole for my bread, as so at Salem until I found them to be an unseparated people. The general court in Boston was very suspicious of his teaching because he advocated the separation of church and state. For this, he was labeled an Anabaptist. He began his labors at Salem under this cloud, which would eventually drive him into exile. The ministers of the Bay Colony, from the churches of Boston, Newtown, Watertown, Roxbury, Dorchester, Salem, and elsewhere, were accustomed to meet for discussion and common interests. Roger Williams feared this might lead to a presbytery, to the detriment of the local church liberty. He was against everything that might make for intolerance. You know, we meet together in a Bible conference. We don't ever have to think about that. But he did in his day. And you might think, well, he's overreacting. Well, you probably need to live in that day to understand what he was up against. In December 1633, he sent to the governor and his assistants a document he had prepared in Plymouth in which he disputed their right to have the land by the king's grant. Williams claimed they, quote, had no title except they compound with the natives, end quote. He accused King James of telling a lie and claiming to be the first Christian prince to discover this new land. This document was never made public. It was never published. Yet it shook the governor and the assistants, because at that very time they were holding the possession to their colony on a charter originally given for a different purpose. It had been granted in England to a trading company, and its transfer to the Puritans was questionable. They feared the king might withdraw it. They met with Williams, and he, seeing the danger to the colony, agreed to withdraw the document and give what they called evidence of his loyalty to them. It was not long before another question was raised by Roger Williams. Arthur Strickland, in his book, Roger Williams, Prophet and Pioneer of Soul Liberty, writes, This pioneer of soul liberty raised a new question concerning the propriety of administering an oath, which is an act of worship, to either the unwilling or the unregenerate. Williams' position was particularly obnoxious to the magistrates, who were then on the point of testing the liberty of the colonists, administering an oath of allegiance, which was to be, in reality, allegiance to the colony instead of the king. The court was called to discuss the new objection to its policy. Williams objected on two grounds. First, because the state was requiring an oath of all its subjects, including the most corrupt, forcing unregenerate persons to swear before God, forced them to take the Lord's name in vain, this profane God, this created sin. This violated one, one of God's fundamental commandments. Secondly, he argued that an oath was part of God's worship. Swearing an oath was a serious and spiritual act. It represented striving after God, seeking God, submitting to God, an oath linking God in the swear. 
Yet this oath, an oath before God to perform a worldly act, instead, instead linked the state with its subjects, requiring men to pledge before God and to God for an earthly purpose, equated an earthly and necessarily corrupt kingdom with God's holy kingdom. This oath, uh, this loyalty oath, which was called the oath of fidelity, or also the freeman's oath, was required of every man of or above the age of 16. It read in part this way, one uniform order of discipline in the churches, agreeable to the scriptures, for the preservation of that uniformity and peace of the churches. Again, to quote from John Barry, he writes, Cotton justified it. This was John Cotton, the Puritan pastor. He justified it, arguing that upon intelligence of some episcopal and malignant practices against the country, which means upon learning of the threat of a governor general who would impose Laud's Church of England upon New England, the magistrates and general court decided to take trial of the fidelity of the people, not by imposing upon them, but by offering to them an oath of fidelity, as though it's just your free choice whether you take this or not. Those who refused it, he said, suffered only that magistrates might not betrust them with place of public charge and command. John Barry then says, Cotton's analysis was, to put it gently, disingenuous. Anyone twice offered the oath, and who refused twice to take it was subject to banishment. And then he says, to put it less gently, Cotton was lying. Williams began to protest in Salem. Cotton reported that he, quote, vehemently withstood the magistrates, end quote, and that he drew not a few good persons towards his, toward his conclusions, not only in Salem, but throughout the plantation. Almost immediately, the governor... And assistants met and sent for Mr. Williams. No record of this meeting exists. But references to it make it clear that the magistrates called upon numerous ministers and almost certainly included Cotton, Hooker, Richard Mather, and John Elliott to confront Williams and rebut him. All were Cambridge graduates, trained in disputation, and it goes on to describe a little bit of this. I'll pass by some of it, but they they would have questioned him and uh, tried to really put a lot of pressure on him. Winthrop report, reported that uh, reported nothing of the debate itself, only that Williams quote was heard before all the ministers and was very clearly refuted or confuted, very clearly confuted. Williams very clearly did not consider himself confuted, nor did most of the plantation. To the contrary, his position resonated throughout the colony. This resonance, in fact, grew strong enough to force the court to retrace its steps and desist. It stopped administering the oath, a fact which, which Cotton noted caused the authorities serious embarrassment, the more for his reputation for sanctity. He was known for pure way of life, and they tried to seek occasion against him, but they couldn't in that way. Williams began to push upon his advantage, pressing anew his old complaints. He attacked forced tithes and giving tax money to ministers, insisting no one should be bound to maintain a worship against his own consent. And as before, he preached that the state should concern itself only with the world. It should discipline only acts of persons against persons. It was profane for it to involve itself in the first table. On these issues, too, he began to find resonance. He found such in Salem that the church was finally ready to make him formally and officially its teacher. The Boston Massachusetts, with, with its ministers and elders from several churches, advised the church at Salem not to proceed to choose him to office in the church. When these magistrates and ministers gave advice, they expected it to be taken. Despite the pressure, despite the efforts, uh, efforts to agitate the congregation against him, five weeks after the general court ordered the imposition of the oath, 
the major part of the church made choice of Williams as its teacher. The magistrates were defied again and embarrassed again. The Salem Church and Williams were both called upon to appear before the general court, July 18, 1635, to answer complaints made against them. The elders gave their opinion. He who would obstinately maintain such opinions, whereby the church might run into heresy and apostasy or tyranny, ought to be removed, and that the other churches ought to request the magistrates so to do. Now, that's what they're accusing Williams and the Salem church, that it was tyranny on their part. They're turning it around backwards. The church and the pastor were notified to consider the matter until the next general court, and then to recant or expect the court to take some final action. At the same time, the Salem people petitioned for a title to some land at Marblehead Neck, which was theirs, as they believed, by just claim. The court refused to even consider this claim, and this is what they said, until there shall be time to test more fully the quality of your allegiance to the power which you desire to be imposed on your behalf. In other words, until the religious matter was taken care of, they wouldn't consider what they are legally supposed to do to consider this earthly matter. Professor Knoll says, Here is a candid avowal that justice was refused to Salem on the question of civil right as a punishment for the conduct of church and pastor. A volume could not more forcibly illustrate the danger of a connection between civil power and ecclesiastical power. Williams and the people at Salem were indignant and a letter was addressed to the churches of the colonies in protest against the injustice. The churches were asked to admonish the magistrates and deputies within their membership. Now, how do you think that was going to go over? The Sunday they got that, or before they got that uh, letter, would they read that? These churches refused to do this. In most cases, the letters never came before the church. Williams then called his own church to withdraw communion from such churches. They refused to do this. And he withdrew from the Salem church, preaching his last sermon, August 19, 1635. Strauss writes, He stood unshaken upon the ground of his convictions and declared to the Salem church he could no longer commune with them, thereby entirely separating himself from them and them from him. End quote. The time for the next general court drew near. William's withdrawal from his church made his foes determined to crush him. They had thoughts of putting him to death. He was offered a month to consider the matter. He chose, quote, to dispute the matter presently. He said he was ready not only to be bound and banished, but to die also in New England, as for the most holy truths of God in Christ Jesus. He would not recant. The court passed the following sentence upon him on Friday, October 9th, 1635. Now remember, October 9th is when this was passed. Whereas Mr. William Rogers, one of the elders of the Church of Salem, hath broached and divulged diverse new and dangerous opinions against the authorities and churches here, and maintain the same without retraction, it is therefore ordered that the said Mr. Williams shall depart out of this jurisdiction within six weeks, now next ensuing. October 9th, he had to leave in six weeks. Now, he didn't have the local hotel to go to. There was nothing to go to. Williams was banished from Massachusetts Bay Colony, ordered to leave within six weeks' time, at a time when winter was coming on, he fell sick, and so they gave him until spring to leave their jurisdiction. But word came to Boston that some of the people of Salem were coming to William's home to hear God's Word taught. And they wouldn't have that. So they determined to send 14 men to arrest Williams, to put him on a ship headed for England, where Laud and the Church of England would have immediately put him into the Tower of London, there to be tortured 
and face certain death. <coughs> but Providence intervened again, and a, snow, a snowstorm hit the area, and they had to wait to arrest Williams. Winthrop, who was not governor at this point anymore, he still cared for Williams, though he didn't agree with him in many things. They had been friends for many years, and he sent secretly a note to Williams saying they had plans to arrest him. And so Williams fled for his life again. Again, to quote from John Barry in this story, John Underhill was a professional soldier, a man not to be trifled with, and he would soon show himself to be a killing machine. He took 14 men with him, then, in the dead heart of winter, a great blizzard came out of the northeast with heavy gale. The ship was anchored in Boston Harbor, waiting out the storm. For four days, Underwill waited. It was a great storm, leaving snowdrifts as deep as a man. It was likely with great but secret pleasure that Winthrop reported. When he came to his house, they found that he had been gone three days before but whither they could not learn. Williams fled in a blizzard. The snow fell softly but thickly until it rose above his knees. Each step became arduous, exhausting, and decades later he wrote of the weariness that overcame him. He was not without company, however. Packs of wolves haunted the forest, and the savage Indians haunted the forest too. Winthrop described that winter as a very bad season. The cold was intense, violent. It made all about him crisp and brittle, the moisture from his breath freezing to his face. The cold froze even Narragansett Bay, an extraordinary event, for it is a large ocean bay river. Uh, by, uh, let's see, it is a large ocean bay riven by currents and tidal flows. But the cold may also have saved his life. It made the snow light powder, exhausting as it was, to move through it step by step for miles. It lacked the killing weight of heavy, moisture-laden snow. The snow also froze rivers and streams, which he would otherwise had to afford. afforded. The violence of the cold, the desperation of his flight, the depth of the snow, the exhaustion of making his way left a mark on him. Thirty-five years later, he referred to that winter snow which I feel yet. For another kind of cold scarred him also. Men who had been his fellows, his colleagues, his friends, had cast him out. For the rest of his life he could never comprehend their coldness. How could he be, quote, driven from my house and land and wife and children? He had two children, if I recall right. One was... Only a month or two old at that point. They did allow his wife to stay there until he could find a home for them to be in or build a home. And he also says this, How could he be denied the common air to breathe in and a civil cohabitation upon the same common earth and also without mercy and humane compassion be exposed to winter miseries in a howling wilderness? We think we have a land of freedom. It didn't start out that way. We had men that paid the price for what we have. Roger Williams had been prepared providentially. God gave him <clears throat> the physical strength. His manual labor and travel by canoe had strengthened him. Williams would never have survived the cold and the exposure if it had not been for the Indians sheltering him. He had dealt fairly with them, and they trusted him. Wherever he stayed, he survived only because Indians took him in. There was no comfort in this shelter. For 14 weeks, he, as he put it, did not know what bread or bed did mean. 14 weeks. Moving from place to place, <clears throat> enduring distressed wanderings among the barbarians, and destitute of food and clothes during the worst of, as he put it again, I may say as Jacob Peniel, that is, I have seen the face of God, he never gave a full account of these experiences of that winter. 
saying only that the ravens fed me in the wilderness. The memory of these barbarians, as he called them, caring for him after the English cast him out, never left him. The ice of that winter and the cold hearts of those who had rejected or he had regarded as friends and colleagues had left a mark upon his heart. The latter left the deepest scar. For during that winter, Cotton wrote him several letters, at least one of which was carried by Indians to him. It was taunting, saying, If he perished among the barbarians, your blood had been on your own head. It was your sin to proceed or to procure it and your sorrow to suffer it. Decades later, Williams vividly recalled that letter that its heated ferocity and frozen rigidity stopped him. The fact that Cotton sent it at all, knowing the desperate straits he was in, sent it as if exulting in his troubles, stopped him. More even than his banishment, it isolated him and made him feel cut off. Through the winter, Williams remained alone. His family would not join him until he made a new home. In the spring, he settled upon a site suitable, he believed, for that home. It was a forested spot, but with adequate soil and fresh water and close access to Narragansett Bay. In early spring, a handful of men from Salem arrived and joined him. A tiny community began to shape, uh, take shape. They lived in temporary shelters, probably wigwams, after the Indian fashion. The men cleared the land planted crops, and began building homes for their families. They worked through spring and summer, but Massachusetts exerted pressure on Plymouth to expel them. Plymouth Governor Edward Winslow yielded, sending him word that he had, quote, fallen into the edge of their bounds, and they were loath to displease the bay. You see the force that church and state exerts? They were reaching really outside their bounds but they exerted force on them. They had settled on the eastern bank of the river. They crossed to the... If they had crossed to the western bank, they would have passed out of Plymouth territory. Once they moved, Winslow told him, we should be loving neighbors together. More importantly, being outside of any English jurisdiction, he would have the country free before him. Williams had no desire to leave. Can you imagine clearing the land, how they had to do it by hand? Still is enough work for us today. They'd cleared the land, planted the crops, done all of this. He and others had already planted a crop, and they would have to abandon it before harvest. They would have no supplies for winter, but they had no choice. The other side of the river was Narragansett County. Williams had an excellent relationship with the Narragansett Indians. He purchased land from the Indians at the head of the Narragansett Bay at what is now Providence, Rhode Island. He did what he had accused others of not doing. He purchased it from the Indians, and he is known for that. That's one of the things he said, that the English would come here and, by the king's grant, take land without purchasing it from the Indians. There, Roger Williams founded a town which in gratitude to God he called Providence. In Providence, he established a commonwealth where, to use his own words, the will of the majority shall govern the state, yet only in civil matters. God alone is the ruler of the conscience. All men may here walk as their consciences persuade them, everyone in the name of his God, and let the lambs of the Most High in this colony without molestation in the name of Jehovah their God, live forever and ever. Here he was baptized by Ezekiel Holman, one of the men that came with him, from the church of Salem. They had been baptized after the order of Church of England, but not scriptural baptism. And so Ezekiel Holman baptized Williams. Williams then baptized Mr. Holman and ten others, forming what many have considered the first Baptist church in America. However, there was a Baptist church close by at Newport, Rhode Island, established 
about a year before and pastored by Dr. John Clark. And he knew John Clark, at least later. I don't know if he knew him at the beginning here. But later he did know him. In fact, they traveled to England to gain a new charter for that land that he had purchased from the Indians. Now, in this baptism that he received from Ezekiel Holman, we just state that because that is the truth. But this other church at Newport was only about 18 miles away, maybe 20 miles away. So he could have really gone there for baptism, scriptural baptism, had he so desired. Roger Williams continued with this church only four months, at which time he left and disassociated himself from it. He had previously come to understand believers' baptism in its scriptural form, but later he began to question the validity of his baptism, this that he received from Ezekiel Holman even. Williams renounced his church and his baptism as invalid, And then this is where, and if you only knew this about Roger Williams, you would have to say that he was far off from what he should have been. But I have taken the time to read all this to you thus far to show what he's been up against. He came to believe there was no true church existing anywhere in the world. That's a denial of Scripture. That's a serious matter. However, we probably should be quite sympathetic for all he'd gone through. And it reminds me a little bit of Arthur W. Pink whenever he finally just kind of separated himself from various believers and churches and went off and began to write. But still, this is a serious matter to say there is no true church existing anymore. He believed that Christ needed to return and set up new apostles or men inspired by the Holy Spirit who would establish a new foundation. Again, that's what we've been hearing about and will continue to hear about in this conference. J.R. Graves in his book, The First Baptist Church in America, not founded by Roger Williams, said, Williams left the true church, Williams felt the true church being lost in the general corruption There must be a new beginning with new apostles, men inspired of God, authorized to reinstitute the ordinances and worship of the Lord's house. In quote from G.R. Graves. He then turned seeker. There were those in England that did the same thing. In fact, they went through much the same thing. They baptized themselves, then in turn began to question that baptism. And pretty soon they're in such confusion that they turned seeker. They turned away from what they had once known or professed they knew. So he turned uh, seeker and spent the rest of his life disassociated from any church fellowship. Williams lived another 40 years and as far as we know was never associated or united with any Baptist church, either in Newport or Providence. In 1644... Williams wrote his most famous work. It was titled, The Bloody Tenet of Persecution for the Cause of Conscience, discussed in a conference between truth and peace, who in all tender affection presented to the High Court of Parliament as a result of their uh, discourse, these among other passages of highest consideration. That's not the whole of the title. I just stopped there. John Cotton didn't like that because it told what John Cotton and those Puritans had done to him. So he wrote a defense. And I'm only going to read you the first sentence of the title. They believed in titles that describe the book. This is the defense John Cotton wrote, The bloody tenant washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb, being discussed and discharged from blood guiltiness, by just defense, wherein the great question of this present time are handled how far liberty of conscience ought to be given to those that truly fear God and how far restraint to turbulent and pestilent persons, that's Williams, by the way, 
that not only raise the foundation of godliness, R-A-Z-E, raise the foundation of godliness, but disturb the civil peace where they live and how far the magistrate may proceed in the duties of the first table. That's about half the title of it. If you want more, you can Google that. Find it yourself. John Cotton believed, as far as this liberty of conscience, see, the Puritans said, we believe in liberty of conscience. What are you talking about? We believe in that. But they believed only as far as they would instruct your conscience, and you better believe now. And that's where their liberty of conscience ended. That's not liberty of conscience, brethren. So he said this, a person can only claim conscience up until the point they have been instructed. Once they have been instructed, they can no longer claim conscience as a reason for not obeying. Williams published a few more books, of which we'll pass by for now. But he died in 1683. He was buried in an unmarked grave. They think they found the right grave years later. His grave site now is known as where they have a statue of him. But they're not 100% sure they got the right one. But anyway, that probably doesn't matter. This is an interesting note, though. In 1936, the Massachusetts legislature gave an apology in the form of a legislative bill that reads as follows. Sentence of expulsion against Roger Williams by the General Court of Massachusetts Bay Colony in the year 1635, be, here, be and hereby revoked. That was only 301 years later. They finally let him back in. I want to end by quoting a handful of writers, some in just a short quote, some a little bit longer, of what they say about Roger Williams, because this is very telling to read of this. Brother Downing, from out in California, in his book, The New Testament Church, writes, Roger Williams was a man of strong convictions, a great man in many respects, a religious reformer, a statesman, a champion of civil and religious freedom, but he was never truly a Baptist. Isaac Bacchus, in, your, in the book, Your Baptist History, the nature of true liberty of conscience was very little understood in the world. And as God had brought the people here out of an Egyptian bondage and had given them a good land, they imagined they ought to imitate the children of Israel, punishing the wicked and in establishing a holy government in this country. And from hence, they who uphold such a great and good work appeared to them exceedingly criminal. Here we plainly learn the cause why Mr. Williams was treated so cruelly. But as God overruled ruled the cruelty of selling Joseph to the heathen as a means of saving the lives of so many people, so the banishment of Mr. Williams made him a chief instrument of saving all the English in New England from destruction. For he, uh, for he was instrumental in saving all of the... I missed that line... For he obtained much knowledge of the Indian language and friendship with them when war was ready to break out with the most powerful Indian nation in the land. It would have been... Oh, and what would have the English done had they sent Williams out of this country as they intended? But a kind providence prevented it. And he now wrote an account of these things to Boston upon which they sent to him to do his utmost for their relief. And he says, The Lord helped me immediately to put my life in my hand and scarce acquainting my wife to ship myself alone in a poor canoe and to cut through a stormy wind with great seas every minute in hazard of life to the Sachem's house. The Indian leader, the Sachem. Three days and nights my business forced me to lodge and mix with the bloody Pequot ambassadors whose hands and arms me think reeked with the blood of my countrymen, murdered and massacred by them on Connecticut River, and from whom I could not but nightly look for their bloody knives at my throat also. But God wonderfully preserved me and helped me break to pieces their design and to make, promote, and finish many travels and charges 
the English League with the Narragansetts and the Mohegans against the Pequots. And Isaac Bacchus in this, this part that we quote, Yet all the great services which Mr. Williams did for Massachusetts could not prevail with him to take off his sentence of banishment, though Governor Winthrop was for it. W. W. Evarts, in his book, A Long Road to Freedom of Worship, said in summing up the history of the struggle for religious liberty, it may be said that papal bulls and Protestant creeds have favored tyranny. 